Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. Praise God. Welcome New Harvest Church here in Manchester. Thanks for logging on. We're back at you one more time here on a Wednesday night. I would like to tell you, I think, my opinion is you picked a great night to be here with us. We have a good message that we'd like to minister to you today. We pray that your hearts are open. And then no matter what you've been going through personally or through the, your day, maybe you had a struggle at work or at home, a little conflict amongst that little marital strife that happens there, uh, we're glad that you're with us today. We pray you're going to be blessed and encouraged. Praise God. We're looking forward to all the good things God's going to do. Let's start off with prayer. What do you say? I see your heads bobbing back and forth, so let's all pray together this evening. Heavenly Father, thank you for an opportunity to gather with your people, Lord. I pray and reach out to all those homes, Lord God, wherever they're at, here in the UK, out of country, Lord, bless them. I pray pray that you would strengthen us, Lord God, that you would give us favor tonight, and that your Holy Spirit would minister as only you can. We thank you once again for the great things you're going to do, saving souls here in Manchester, saving souls here in the United Kingdom. Give us revival, Lord God. We pray that you would move. Uh, Lord, I pray you'd build up your people tonight. Anoint the message in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Man, again, so good to have you with us tonight. Uh, no matter what's been going on, you made a, a righteous decision to be here uh, with us this evening. Uh, don't have too many announcements. We're still praying for our uh, upcoming uh, July uh, opening, reopening. Uh, again, just stay, keep that in prayer. The Lord knows. The Lord knows, and we're ready to, to jump on it. Uh, we've been doing some work here in the building to get it uh, back into shape. All of that work you saw on the wall has now been plastered, so all of that has been done. Some more plastering has been done in the back of the church. We're going to try to get it all repainted for you by the time we get together. Looking forward to seeing you once again. Gracie and I miss you desperately, and I know you miss each other as well, so it will be a a, a grand time once we get together. Why don't we uh, just go ahead and get into the Word of God. Let's just get started this evening uh, with this message. Praise God. Tonight's uh, sermon, tonight's message is entitled, Living in the Climate of Chaos. Living in the Climate of Chaos. You know that our theme for the year that we talked about on our New Year's Eve service is bringing clarity in the times of chaos, you know, bringing clarity to the chaos that people are involved in. And what is happening now on the streets uh, of the U.S., what we see taking place on our uh, television screens, our computer uh, feeds, is in reality not uncommon. This chaos happens all over If you've been following, you know that in Hong Kong, they've been having for a long time some craziness. We remember years ago uh, the uh, Tiananmen Square and all of that. We're going to pick up the offering at the end just in case you guys are wondering about that. We're going to do that in the end. Uh, But uh, we want to remind you about all the things that are happening in the world throughout the Middle East for decades. Even here in the UK, we've seen our share of troubles. It was uh, just in 2011 here in, in Manchester as well as down in London and other cities, we, we had race riots here. It's a common thing, unfortunately. And it's important, and this is what I want to get at today. It's important to not forget that these stories are about people real people. I know it's easy to get outraged at this is happening or that's happening. This should have occurred. That didn't occur. Whatever issue that is out there today, I want to tell you behind that is real 
people and as believers, as Christ followers, we should be concerned about that because those people are someone's son, someone's daughter, a father, a husband. The reality is those people matter to God. Understandably, there's people in the world. Hold, stick with me. I'm trying to go somewhere here. Understandably, there are people in the world that would rather just ignore it. They, these things feel far from their life and they don't really, aren't too concerned and, you know, they just want to carry on with their life. And I understand that. But on the other hand, I think for us as believers, we have to understand there's a spiritual element behind all of this. My message tonight is not a political message. It's not here to stir the pot and try and cause more problems. What it is, is that as Jesus followers, Jesus people, we have to follow his word. And his word applies to current events. Whatever's going on in your life, his word applies. Whatever's going on in the world, wherever at in the world, it applies, the word applies. So a good start for us tonight as we discuss this living in the climate of chaos is found in the book of Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16. The Bible says there are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things he detests. Haughty eyes, it's pride. A lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent. A heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord in a family. See, it's easy to see for us today that all of these things are happening in the world. And I want to tell you that God is not amused he is not looking at these passively and saying, oh, well, there go my kids again, throwing a temper tantrum. No, my friend, what we're seeing today is something that God is not well pleased with and some things that need to change. And again, I'm not talking about political change here. That belongs to somebody else. My job is to preach the word of God to you and show how the word applies to what we see. So what overriding feelings, and actions do we see currently? First of all, I want to identify the one thing that we see on whichever side of the, the coin you are on on these issues is this issue of hatred, hatred, hate. You know, the, the definition of hatred is the one who feels hates, intense dislike or extreme aversion to hostility. This is what it is somebody, or extreme, avert, extreme hostility, I'm sorry, not too hostility. And so the point is, is that we see a lot of this going on. Sometimes it's being labeled down into race. Other times it's against any kind of authority. Sometimes it's authority against the people they should be governing. But whatever the case is, the underlying uh, oh, cause and emotion is this emotion of hatred. And you know, if, if it was just happening to the unsaved and it was just uh, a hatred that happens to people who don't care about God, we might do well to ignore it. But the truth is, is there are Christians here tonight, I say in this world today, that feel hate. They know what hatred is. Maybe some of you have been watching things on the news or going through something with your family or your work and hatred has reared its ugly head. See, when a person hates, it means that they're unwilling to do something, put the fill in the blank. If you hate housework, I'm unwilling to do housework. If you hate uh, uh, doing paperwork, uh, you're unwilling to do the paperwork. If you hate another race, it means you're unwilling to engage with that race. If you hate what's going on politically, then you're unwilling to engage in that race. And as Christians, that's not an option for us. We cannot be unwilling participants in what God has called us to do, to be salt and light. We cannot allow hatred to stop us from doing what he expects from us. 
unwilling when we have hatred to compromise, to sympathize, or to demonstrate empathy. That's what happens when people start to hate. It can happen even amongst a husband and a wife. Started off loving each other a long time ago, and as time has gone on, elements of hate, degrees of hate begin to occur. And the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 10, and verse number 12, hatred stirs up conflict. Isn't that what we see so much of? Hatred stirring up conflict, but love covers all wrongs. See, hatred abounds in our society today. At the moment, we're seeing it all over the news, aren't we? We're seeing police in riot gear. We've seen it in this country. I mean, people even in this country before we had Brexit said if Brexit doesn't pass, there's going to be riots in the streets because this is what happens. Hatred can come. Right now, it's rearing its ugly head through racism, as we said, violence and pillaging and and all of these kinds of things. Hatred, though, listen to this, even in support of a just cause is never the answer. Some people think because their cause is just, because this was right, I can demonstrate hatred. We are Christians. We are on the side of truth. We are Christians. We are on the side of righteousness. But hatred is never allowed because it stirs up conflict. Are are you with me tonight? I hope you are. See, the second part of the proverb shows us what is lacking in today's public dialogue. And that word is love. The opposite of hatred is love. Love covers all wrongs. See, the truth is, if people on whichever side, whatever skin color they are, if they're in charge of the police department or they've uh, uh, been abused by the police department, if they could demonstrate love on whatever side, oh man, that would change so much. You know why? Because God says it would change. God says it would change. If a person could just begin to understand this agape, you know, we've talked about that word a lot of times. That's kind of love that comes from God, then we could begin to live it out in our personal lives, and hatred would begin to dissipate. Sometimes the reason that we allow our hearts to go towards hate is not because we're so much prone to hatred, but there's just that vacuum left when the absence of love. And that's why I want to encourage you tonight to recognize that agape love is superior to all other types of love. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. See, this agape love can only be accessed, as you know, through a relationship with God. If you're watching today and you say, man, I need to learn how to love. I have a little love here and there. I want to tell you, you need God's love. You need to accept it and receive it in your life and then begin to express it and live it out so that hatred does not rule your heart. Whenever there's conflict, you can eliminate it by eliminating hatred because of agape love. Agape love is alive and accomplishes God's purposes. Are you paying attention this evening? Not only do we see hatred in the streets, and have seen hatred in the streets. And I want to tell you, I'm no prophet, but we will continue to see this. This is just the tip of the iceberg as far as my mind goes. I see lots of things happening, and Christians, we're called to make a difference. That's why one reason why I feel so frustrated being a, alone in this building, just here preaching to a camera, because I want to make a difference with people, don't you? Don't you? And once we gather back and we regroup and we reopen, man, we better be ready to do some work, not only here in the church, but out there reaching people. Can you say amen? You can start now talking to your neighbor. Don't debate the politics. Don't debate the one issue that everybody's trying to bring out. Talk about hatred and then give them the answer, which is agape love. But the second thing that that is out there in the street is the issue of anger. Anger. The problem with anger is that it's like fire. When it's confined 
and it's controlled. Oh, it's so helpful. Some of you, after this is over, some of you might be even doing it right now. You might want to go, if you have a gas hob, and put something on there and cook something on there. Isn't it nice to be able to turn on your gas hob? You know, we're from Los Angeles, and we love Mexican food, and tortillas are like a little flat pancake that we like to eat. Wraps is what we call them here. But we have an electric hob. It doesn't do us justice. What we like is the fire, so you can put it on there and kind of burn it a little bit. I know it sounds disgusting when I see, describe it to you, but it tastes wonderful. And the point is, is that when gas and fire is confined, it's a wonderful thing. But one flame, listen to this, can ignite a wildfire because that's the nature of fire and that's the nature of anger is that it begins to spread so quickly. Anger unleashed can destroy Some of you might have been wrestling with anger throughout your life and it burns and it's difficult because it destroys inwardly, but it also destroys outwardly. The personal toll for untethered anger is not worth the short-term gain that you get from releasing the anger. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Listen to me tonight. On the other hand, anger cannot be avoided altogether. This is why, you know, it seems foolish to me to try to become some sort of monk, you know, that, and you can just be someone that's very off and adrift and aloof and uh, separated yourself from society, because then you'll go and you'll stub your toe when you're all alone, and you'll be like, ah, because ah, anger can happen no matter what, but anger can be a motivator. Did you know that? There's no doubt that people were angered by what they saw in the video of George Floyd being killed on the streets of Minneapolis. That anger, properly channeled, can be a motivator to change the way things are. You might be righteously angry at something you see in your family. Get down and pray. Change it as much as you can. You might be angered by what you see within yourself. You can take some time, begin to deal with it, begin to pray. Don't be too hard on yourself, but be firm with yourself and say, hey, I'm angry at the way things are. I want to see change. Are you tired of people going to hell? Are you tired of people being lost? That ought to put a righteous indignation, a righteous anger within you so that you can begin to be motivated by it. Anger, repeating again, correctly channeled, can be a positive motivator. What do you do when you're angry? What do you do? The question I'm posing to you. What do you do? Do you just blow up and try to get over it? Like, I just need to get away and get, you know, is that what you do? Which a lot of people do, and that's probably okay, I guess. But what would be a better thing would be to try to learn, like, why am I angry? What is it that I need to see change? What is it in me that's causing this anger? It, 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 it makes me think there are people that live in this country and other countries that are angry at something that's happening in the United States, a place that they don't live, never have lived, know very little about other than what they've seen on the television. Those who visited know a little bit about it. But why are they angry? Because it's something, it strikes a chord within them. And it's what strikes a chord within them that they need to address and positively channel that anger. Now, with that being said, I want to move on, talk about another important thing that we have tonight that we see happening in the world in which we live, and it's especially happening here with this issue uh, in the United States, what's happening in Hong Kong and again, uh, in many other places. And that is this issue of what I'm calling untamed words. Untamed words. See, we don't ever want to just speak basic words and no words that have no import. On the other hand, we don't have to always use sensational words and extravagant words and, 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 and huge, uh, you know, those kind of words. But understand, we do have to control our words. We have to domesticate our words. Because in times of anger and hatred, people who would normally control their words 
and use mitigating words. Those are words that would reduce the conflict level and bring the stress level down. Sometimes those kind of people can even transform their words uh, into uh, savage and unruly words uh, and say things uh, that they'll uh, uh, later regret. I want to tell you, to my friend, today that we have to be careful of the things that we say. Many things are said in the heat of the moment that stay with us long into the fullness of time. Mm. We say things in the heat of the moment that stick with us in the fullness of time. You know, Gracie and I, we have things that we've said to each other that we still remember today. We've forgiven each other. We've moved on. We're, 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 we're far past that in our relationship, but we haven't forgotten. They're still there. We can't go back and change those. We can only forgive on those things, but we can watch ourselves now to recognize that untamed words can spark a fire, can spark a fire. Sometimes what's happening in these big uh, kind of protest said the protest isn't the problem people need to protest the problem is the rioting isn't it that that's the part that's gotten out of hand and when things like rioting begins to happen you got people saying things that inflame and hurt and that can destroy people and if it was just confined to the to the rioting in the world we we might be able to push it aside but these untamed words enter into our world where we say things to people that we shouldn't say, things that we need to get a hold of, hurtful things spread fire. The book of James says it best. In James chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, again, familiar passage, it says, in the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire for it is set on fire by hell itself. All I can say to that, brothers and sisters, is wow, Wow, we don't heed that very often. Do you hear the dramatic language that's being used here by God to get us to comprehend what untamed words are like? It corrupts your entire person. The things you say, we always think of hurting other people, which is true, but it corrupts you. It's a fire set on a flame of fire, set on fire by hell itself. I know none of you would say you're demonic, but when you speak untamed words, you are speaking for hell itself. Eugene Peterson paraphrases the same passage like this. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire, a careless a wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it, smoke right from the pit of hell. So just as we see hatred in the streets of the world today, and anger in the streets of the world today. Hatred and anger also in the hearts of Christians as well. That's why I'm talking to you here this evening. We also recognize these untamed words are existent as well. Now, what do we need to do? We need to tame the tongue, domesticate the tongue, get the tongue under control, and fortunately, that's possible. Aren't you glad? Because if not, we'd be destined to a life of not talking. That would be horrible for me. You know, when Gracie and I first met, I rarely talked. That's why she liked me so much, because I didn't say much. Now, I wake up in the morning and go, hey, you want to talk? 
<laughs> and I do double the amount of words that she does. I got to learn to talk less. <laughs> but I thank God that I can still talk as long as I tame my tongue. And so can you. And we should. So taming a tongue requires a couple of things. First of all, it requires a right heart. A right heart. See, one of the problems that we have in the world today, <clears throat> one of the problems we have in the world today and the chaos that we're seeing is because words flow from the heart. So the things that you're hearing out of people's mouths are coming from who they really are. And they're acting as if that's no problem. And it wouldn't be a no problem, it would be no problem as if their heart was right. But oftentimes their heart's not right. Look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34. He calls these religious people, you brood of snakes. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. That's true. That's true. Just controlling your tongue and in the sense of not talking as much, that's not the answer. Talking less might be helpful to a degree, but the real issue is your heart. Real issue is getting your heart right with God. And that's one thing that no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, no matter what you think about what's going on in the streets of America at the moment, can I tell you something? Nothing can be changed without a right heart. And only God can change that heart. And just because we're Christians doesn't mean our hearts are fully changed. Are you with me? So to tame our words, first of all, we need a right heart. But secondly, what we need, and this is, uh, I, I can't put uh, a greater importance on this than this, and that's self-control. Self-control. See, here, here's what happens. When a person thinks they're right, boy, God, I, I got to tell you, I know this is true. I've, I, I've experienced this uh, in this negative way that I'm talking about. When a person thinks they're right, it's easy to think that they can say what they like. Well, I'm right, therefore I can speak. Not the case. Not the case. Sometimes you're exactly right, but the time is not to talk. The time that either does God want you to say it, are the people around ready to be the people that you should be delivering this kind of message to? Should be, you be talking to them about this particular thing? I mean, even the Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter 7 and verse 6, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. See, it says don't give holy, what's holy to the dogs. Sometimes you may be right, but you have to withhold your tongue because they're not ready to receive it. They're not ready to hear it. I might have told this story before. Uh, I remember I was a young convert. Uh, I was excited. I was just starting to be discipled and wanted to grow in the things of God. And we went to a, uh, one of our Bible conferences that was about an hour away from Los Angeles. And uh, we went to the conference there and we stayed in this motel that wasn't all that great, but it was what we could afford. And so we went to this motel and when we got there, uh, or, or one of the nights after the service, there were these guys that were out drinking. They were our kind of guys, too, man. They'd been on the streets. We knew exactly what kind of guys they were because we were those people before we were saved. And so they were all drinking and getting drunk. And I remember telling one of the older brothers that were with me, hey, let's go preach at them. He goes, nah, we're not going to preach. They're drunk. It's not the right time. And I remember thinking, like, well, I had to learn that lesson. There's a time when to say things and a time not to say things. Can you say amen? We should learn to be and strive to be like Isaiah in the book of Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number four. Look what he says. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. See, I want to tell you here, this should be our desire. Lord, help me to speak with the tongue of the learned. Let me be that type of individual that speaks a, a proper words, not so much in your vocabulary is perfect or anything like that, but a word in season, a word that comforts, a word to those who need to hear it. 
And if you notice something about that passage, Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4, is that it's not just about him talking. He can't talk unless he hears. He has to listen properly. That's one of the problems that we see in the world today. There's not dialogue going on. There's just preaching. I'm just preaching at you. I'm just going to tell you why, you know, racism is wrong. I'm going to tell you why I act the way you do, I do. I'm going to tell you why the government's wrong or the cops are wrong or this is wrong. I'm going to preach at you. And the other side begins to preach back. And there's just preaching going on back and forth. And it never works. Uh, Sometimes we need to listen. And then when we listen, God gives us the tongue of the learned because we learn something. And then we're able to speak a word in season. Can you say amen? See, this kind of talk is what I call Christianity 101. Simple Christianity. It's basic type of speech for those who are disciples. In the book of Colossians, chapter 4 and verse number 6, it says, let your speech always be with grace. How often should your speech be with grace? Yep, always, always. Boy, that's a, a learned a uh, uh, principle. You have to learn to speak like this. It doesn't come naturally. That you may know how you ought to answer each one. Remember back when I was telling you about Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, don't give what is holy to the dogs or cast your pearls before swine. See, that's how you know is when you begin to uh, have gracious speech. It helps you to know when to say something and when not to say something. If you got harsh, quick, hey, I got to get my point across kind of speech, then you're not going to succeed very well. It's one of the problems we see in the world today. Proverbs 25, 11, common verse says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Hallelujah. Today, we've looked at what we're seeing played out on our television screens and our news feeds, hatred, anger, untamed words. I can't, it's frustrating to me, but I can't do anything about that in general. I'm not a politician. I'm not a political activist. I'm a man of God. I'm a Christian. As a Christian, as a man of God, I can make a difference, but it starts with me. The same for you. You're a man, a woman of God. You're a Christian. You can make a difference by dealing with your hatred, your anger, and your untamed words. I wanted to close by telling you about quickly about a man named Thomas A. Terence. Thomas A. Terence. According to his book, Consumed by Hate, Redeemed by Love. Consumed by Hate, Redeemed by Love. I haven't read it. Maybe one of you needs to read it and report back to me. He was a violent white supremacist. And he said by his own words, I deserved to die for the things that he thought and the actions that he did. He deserved to die. His mother, on the other hand, was a Christian. And his mother constantly, from the time he was young, influenced him in the things of God, even though he went the way of the, being a leader of the Ku Klux Klan, white supremacists. And he had his mother, who was influencing him, didn't work very well for him, but she also had two ladies that she enlisted to pray for him every week, and she did. He eventually came to Christ, renounced his white supremacist views. He decided to get involved in ministry. He became a pastor in a multiracial church in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is the most segregated, uh, one of the most segregated uh, cities in all of America. It has more crime. uh, It has more racist views. uh, it, It is a horrible place in many ways. And yet here is where he pastored for two decades. 
And to tie him into the UK, not only was he pastor of this multiracial church, he was also the president of the C.S. Lewis Institute, the great English writer. See, what am I trying to say? Things can change. I know we can look at things and say how hopeless they are, and that's why we express hatred and anger and say things that we shouldn't. But things can change by the power of Christ because he is the catalyst and the substance for change. You know how we talk about hatred, anger, and untamed words? I want you to think about this man, Thomas H. Terrence. He was filled with hatred by his own admission, own admission, and he eventually became a man of love and was able to express love to the very people that he said he hated. He was an angry young man, but he became calm and comforting and filled with joy. And finally, he had evil, harmful, downgrading words and rhetoric. And then he became to be an eloquent preacher of God's truth. Things can change by the power of Jesus. Praise God. We're going to pray tonight. Would you bow your heads right there in your home and allow me to pray with you tonight? Dear Heavenly Father, I ask this evening, God, for your grace and your mercy to be upon your people, helping them and encouraging them in each and every way. Lord, meet the needs within their life, Lord. Provide for them as only you can. Strengthen them, Father God. And we pray that you would uh, 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 be with them as we depart tonight. If there's any that need to come to know you, Lord God, bless them with salvation. Open their heart. Lord, Christians who need to deal with this hatred, this anger and untamed words, Lord God, meet the needs in their life. Father, we thank you and we pray this today in Jesus' name. If you need to come to Christ, you let us know. We'll pray with you. If you want to be like Thomas A. Terrence, have a transformation in your life, we can pray with you. Christians, never give up hope. Deal with your own hatred, anger, and untamed words, and God will bless you. Tonight, before we close, we're also going to take up tonight's offering. Yes, amen. We are certainly going to do that. So this evening, if you can bank transfer money, then you can give to God. If you can't bank transfer money and you're waiting for a church to open, no problem. Keep that stack of cash there, and you can bring it in and give it to the Lord when you come in. And it won't be long. It won't be long. I know some of you have expressed to us you can't wait to come because you want to be able to give. You don't bank transfer. You don't have that kind of online facility. Don't worry. Just hang on to it. Don't let the devil tempt you. But for all of us that do have online banking, let's bank transfer to the Lord. Make sure that you give. Pay your tithes. Do these things because these things make a difference in your personal life. Of course they help the church, but that's not the point. The point at the moment, it starts with you. When you give, God blesses. We're going to pray for the offering tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for this offering. We pray, Lord God, that as these uh, numbers are flashed on the screen, Lord God, the, the, the bank details, Lord, that you would just begin to speak to those, Lord, that are giving today, that you're going to meet their need. You're going to provide for them in their jobs. You're going to come through for them with flying colors, Lord God. I pray that you would bless each giver as they give, provide jobs and encourage as only you can. And we thank you today for what you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Men. Thank you again for logging on, for listening through. I hope it ministered to you. We will have it on podcast so you can get the audio if you like. And uh, thanks again for your gifts and your investment. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your week. We'll see you back on Sunday. Don't forget Friday. We have Pray at Home, 7 to 8 o'clock. God bless you. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, The easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M36BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling, and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you, and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you, we're praying for you, and once again, thank you for listening.